he took his first step into freedom, which turned out to be a beautiful thing indeed. His name is Albert, and he is a gargoyle, though his name is as if he were a prince of all humans. This is the merit of the Creator, who, by the way, has long since left this world, killed by the demon King Lan. In the first year of his life, Albert was unable to resist what was happening because of the magic of control that made him an obedient slave. He was deprived of his freedom of choice and felt like a puppet doing whatever his master ordered. Those who succumbed to such a spell were treated like trash and very short-lived. Now, however, fate has finally turned to Albert Though he never really lived a free life until the death of King Lan, for a thousand and a half years, the gargoyle had done nothing but fight, and every wound was forever imprinted in his memory. Albert only dreamed of the day when he could take revenge on his master, but the latter reclined faster than that. In any case, he would now live his life as only he pleased. Of course, he was left without money, power, and status in society. But why these trifles when there is freedom? And so began the life of a gargoyle. Albert turned back noticing that Lan's castle was still burning. He folded his arms and ironically thanked the former king for all those hard years of war. It felt just fine, yet he didn't even know what to do now. Albert suggested that the first thing to do was to get out of the woods. Suddenly, his attention was drawn to several kin who were actively discussing something. He thought that they were weakened, so he decided to talk because they might know where to go. Albert began to convince them that they were gargoyles just like him so there was nothing wrong with talking. Although, on the other hand, caution should have been exercised. Finally, he decided that there was no other way anyway, and they seemed friendly. Albert came out of the bushes, wondering why they had such sour faces, and then offered his help. Suddenly, he caught himself thinking that it sounded too bad. Though that was to be expected, considering he'd never interacted with anyone in all those 1,500 years. Still, he couldn't understand why they were looking at him so suspiciously. Finally, one of the gargoyles explained that they were discussing the best way to get to Far. Albert realized that they were talking about the nearest town south of here. The sorcerer said that they had decided to travel by air, but they couldn't see if they could get over the mountain ranges. Albert reminded them that wyverns live there, though on the other hand, when working as a team, the risk of running into trouble is much lower, so they need to become friends for the ages. The interlocutor stated that it wasn't exactly true but the general gist was correct. Albert couldn't believe that someone liked his plan, and after conferring, the gargoyles decided to set off. He was looking forward to this moment so much, when he would be working in the same team with his friends, when suddenly he was called out, he asked again, but didn't even notice as he grabbed one of his new friends by the leg. The one managed to break free and said goodbye, which confused Albert somewhat. He asked them to stop, confessing that he was beginning to think of them as friends. His heart just couldn't take it, but the gargoyles only laughed that they didn't need junk. Albert waved his hands, wondering how he'd gotten it wrong. He urged his kin to forget what had happened and work together for a common result. He asked them to keep quiet and say something, but the gargoyle leader only repeated that they didn't need Albert. He fell to his knees, not understanding why it had gone this way, and he couldn't fly as it was bad luck. Either way, the plan had failed and nothing had worked. It turns out that he just sat there, watching his kin leave him. At the end of the war between the Demon King's land and Berea, which Albert had been involved in since day one, his wings burned. Though he had to part with a part of himself, he found that the best of all the demon lords was Berea. He wouldn't have minded using self-regeneration at all, but Albert decided to rid himself of bad thoughts and think positively. Yes, he had fought in a brutal war between demon kings that was frankly pointless, but in the end, his fate turned out pretty well. If you think about it that way, nothing super awful had happened, although he would never get rid of his wounds. In fact, he considered himself much luckier than his kin. For example, Albert had once fought an ancient dragon with the strongest roar of all. As for the rest of the gargoyles, they were in the eastern part and kept as powerful pets. The most important thing was that after all these battles, he was still alive. In fact, he even felt sorry for his kin, as they were all essentially still young fledgling. Suddenly, Albert shook his head, chasing the bad thoughts away. The past was good, of course, but the future was much more important. From now on, he decided to think only about that. Speaking of important, the gargoyle felt it would be a good idea to have a snack. When he was committed to the spell, energy flowed into him. But now there was a problem with that. Apparently, it was all about prioritizing right now. He crouched down on the ground, and began to think about where he could get some food. The first thing that came to mind was to hunt in the vicinity of the forest and then cook the prey. 
Of course, there might be a poisonous enemy, but if the meat was cooked properly, it would be quite good. Albert immediately remembered the wonderful days when he and his creator had dined together. He had helped him with his work, and the man had taught him language, life, and magic, and everything else he could do except cooking. For this reason, one would have to give in to chance, and even if the target turned out to be poisonous, one would have to fill one's stomach with something. The second option is to get to the nearest settlement and eat heartily in a local cafe. In this case, you don't even have to cook. The only problem was that Albert didn't have any money, so he would have to work somewhere before the meal. He supposed it would be incredibly fun to fly over the mountain ranges, even though those rascals treated him like garbage. It would take about five days to walk, except that Albert wasn't sure if he could stand that distance on an empty stomach. In that case, there is a third option. Aro supplies from Queen Berea's army. This is probably the best option of all, but again, Albert is not completely sure if he will be able to realize his plan because he has not even seen the face of the queen. Besides, the gargoyle had no idea where to find them, and to fight in his current position is also not really advantageous, because Berea can call for the help of an army if she only wants to. This demon lord is one of the silent rulers who never kill with their own hands, but with the hands of others easily. Albert wasn't sure he'd be spared, especially considering the little incident where he'd thrown the queen around, held her by the hair, and then even impaled her with a stake. Even now, thinking back on it, he felt slightly embarrassed. However, it wasn't entirely his fault, for because of that damned spell, Albert couldn't even choose who to look at, though even with that thought he felt guilty about what had happened. Suddenly, Berea's hair appeared in the gargoyle's hand. It looked like he could create the things he needed with magic. He caught himself thinking that he wasn't a sick pervert at all. But on the other hand, Berea is an ancient and powerful bloodsucker, so perhaps there is some terrible magic in her hair. Albert wondered if the queen would ever forgive him, but suddenly he thought again that he didn't want to kill her, and her body was probably capable of regeneration, and there was no wound left. However, he doubted that he could do that to such a beautiful girl again. Albert assumed it would be a good idea to start by saying hello, since it didn't seem strange to him at all that Berea was someone like an enemy. The gargoyle even began to imagine how he would fall on his knees in front of her and tell her how he had been thinking about what had happened all this time, but he decided not to continue. Still, he doubted that Beria would understand and forgive. Albert caught himself thinking that he was a very pathetic creature, but it was better to think about how not to starve to death. He decided to walk, following the signs to reach the town and on the way he could hunt the local fauna. Albert even thought about talking to some of the villagers. He didn't really want to be alone, and he didn't want to live in the mountains either. Finally, he decided to go, figuring that he could reach Farah in about five days. Even if he couldn't find food, he could at least survive on water for a few days. Luckily, Albert had some magic. He even thought that if he could strengthen his own body with magic, he would be able to run to the final destination in a day although it was not desirable to attract unnecessary attention. Finally, Albert set off through the thicket of the forest, humming a tune under his breath. Surprisingly, it was quite peaceful, and no magical creatures were encountered along the way. He wondered if even one would be enough to fill him up. Albert even began to shout, ordering the creatures to leave, when suddenly he heard a woman's shrill cry. It looked like the evil had come out after all, so it might even be possible to eat. Albert continued to walk through the forest, trying to shout to the imp, but he was not very successful. He didn't realize that he had so much to forgive, and then he thought about how nice it would be to turn around and fly. But these thoughts immediately made the gargoyle sad. In fact, even this view of the forest was getting boring. But Albert decided to continue on his way to the city, until he noticed one thing. His legs, which seemed too short to his master, and there was nothing to say about the width of his stride. Albert continued walking, for the ridge was still so far away that he couldn't even see it from here. Suddenly, he stepped on a branch again, which dug into his foot, causing incredible pain. If he was flying, such problems would certainly not occur. But now, Albert was dreaming of a pair of shoes. He even decided that he would buy himself a pair of waterproof ones as soon as he got there and made some money. But it would be nice to have something to eat first. By the evening of the second day, Albert could finally see the ridge and assumed that the goal was not far away, although he had no idea how he would get over it. Suddenly, his stomach twisted so hard that the gargoyle leaned over thinking about how hungry he was. For a second, Albert even thought about chewing on the ground, but immediately discarded these bad ideas. After all, gargoyles are born hunters, although that was the main problem right now. 
His stomach was empty and his head was full of inadequate thoughts. But suddenly Albert remembered that he had magic, though he didn't know how to feed himself that way. He didn't understand why the undead were hiding and then assumed that with King Land's death, the forest had also changed. Albert suggested that he should pray properly and suddenly he heard a woman's shrill cry. He rushed to the source, assuming that a heroine had appeared. But when he reached the place, he found only a girl of rather small stature. It looked like her ears were starting to fail, but her eyes were not clearly a goblin. In any case, he wanted to see the unclean, and his efforts were not wasted, and fate itself sent a dragon, which, however, still had to be defeated. Albert, of course, is not a hero. However, simply cannot help but save the unfortunate one. The dragon was about to swallow the victim, opening its huge maw, but the gargoyle used a powerful water barrier, throwing the monster aside. He informed the girl that she was now safe and that her yearning for life had forced the voice to reach the webbing of her savior. After examining the little girl, Albert concluded that she was unharmed, but the girl wondered who was in front of her. The gargoyle was prevented from answering by the dragon, who decided to go for a second round, and he seemed to be even angrier. Albert admitted that in another situation, he would have just run away, but he was too hungry now, so he suggested that his opponents seeing the huge monster above him. Albert suggested that this wasn't exactly a good idea. The whole situation seemed incredibly ridiculous to him now, with the dragon up above and the gargoyle somewhere below, deprived of its own wings. The creature had made him quite angry, and so he was determined. Albert began to ponder how he could slay the beast without damaging the meat. Suddenly, the dragon flew downwards rapidly, and the gargoyle suddenly realized how fast his enemy was. Nevertheless, he prepared to strike a decisive blow as soon as the monster got a little closer. Finally, the dragon was at the right distance, so Albert swung his arm, slicing the monster's neck, causing the latter to fall to the ground with force. It was easy enough, it was only worth picking the right pace, and now it was time for lunch. Albert walked over to his prey, contemplating how to eat it. Only boiling or roasting came to mind, but he wasn't much good with fire magic. His stomach rumbled again, so the gargoyle decided to start with something and began cleaning the carcass. It looked like the softest place was the belly, though it didn't look particularly tasty. In any case, there weren't many options, so Albert sat down on the ground and started to eat, when suddenly the girl screamed, asking him to stop. Albert had completely forgotten about the goblin he had rescued and asked why he shouldn't eat it, since even humans liked meat and his body was desperate for it. The girl explained that wyvern meat is poisonous and therefore it should be dried for at least a week before eating it. Albert couldn't believe that he should wait another whole week, but the girl was surprised that the gargoyle didn't know that. In any case, he was thankful for the warning and the goblin was thankful for the rescue. By the way, she introduced herself as Diadalion and she called the slime that had been in her arms the whole time Bayum. Albert marveled at how well-mannered the little one in front of him was and then introduced himself in return. D.I. noticed that her rescuer had dealt with the wyvern very coolly and even suggested that he was the strongest in the forest. Albert explained with a satisfied look that he had been alive for 1,500 years and had even survived the war, which surprised the little girl. Nevertheless, she admitted that she didn't really believe these stories, though she apologized. The goblin moved closer to the body, wondering what the wyvern was doing here after all. Albert wondered what to do now, because he couldn't eat the dragon, and he couldn't eat the girl, so he had to think of something. He asked Day if the belly was poisonous and it was confirmed. In that case, he informed that he would eat the other part, but the girl screamed that then he would die immediately. The gargoyle objected that he would die from waiting anyway, but suddenly Daya offered her help in cutting up the carcass, explaining that the slime could suck out the poison in just a few hours. Albert rejoiced at the chance, wondering why the goblin had been silent earlier. The TA explained that Baum was still too weak. Sure, they got rid of the Demon King Lan spell, but there are no rivers nearby, and without water, the slime is very bad. In fact, it's only still alive because it feeds on the sweat of its mistress. Slime is 99 water, and in the center of its body, there is a nucleus where the liquid accumulates. It is the nucleus that provides the life force, Dai explained that if Bomb didn't replenish his supply soon, he wouldn't last long. In that case, Albert asked if using water magic would help the slime. The girl said she could try and held out the gargoyle's pet, asking him to save it too. Albert promised to help, but in return, he asked her to help him too. Day immediately began to bow, despite the gargoyle's assurances that she shouldn't do so just yet. 
he looked at the pair of them and found it a little funny. The powerless goblin and the weakened slime. Day pulled a knife out of her bag, warning him that she would do the carcass butchering for now. Albert stepped closer to the dying creature, concluding that it was his turn to reward the goblin and promised to do his best for his dinner was at stake. Albert swung his arms, using his level 7 water magic, causing a wave to hit the slime, causing the latter to scream. After examining Bomb, Albert concluded that he was feeling much better and Dai reported that she was already finished. The gargoyle thanked him, explaining that he had also done his best, as the girl suddenly froze, wondering with horror what it was. Albert couldn't understand what was wrong. After all, she herself had asked to cure her pet. Dai agreed, and then, apologizing, yelled out what the hell the gargoyle had done. Since the slime had increased in size ten times over, he explained that it was all down to the wave and level 7 magic. But Dai found herself glad Bomb was okay, either way. She hugged him, asking him to handle the poison in the meat. Slime began to coat the carcass until every part of the dragon was in. Steam began to rise from the meat, and soon, about 30 minutes later, Bayam spit out everything he had absorbed. The girl was surprised that the whole process had taken so little time as it would have taken him at least two hours before. She assumed that the slime had fully recovered. By the way, Albert asked how they understood each other, if they were just communicating, and Dai confirmed the guess. The girl assumed that it was because she had lived with demons for a long time. But she noticed that Albert also had unusual abilities. For example, she noticed that the gargoyle was quite good with magic. Demons have innate abilities common to all living things, such as communication. They can speak without using words, which, by the way, is very convenient. Even demons of lower ranks have such talents. Those with higher ranks, however, are able to use magic. That is why there are so many warring individuals among them, but there are also those who are unlucky enough to be born without any abilities at all. In fact, Albert realized that he had no ability at all, but he didn't voice it. The new acquaintances thanked each other again, and Daya was about to leave, but the gargoyle asked her to stop. He offered her lunch, which surprised the girl, who could not even think of such a thing. Albert wondered, why Nopsy? He even assumed that the goblin had supplies, but she objected that she had been eating only herbs for half a day. In that case, the gargoyle offered to start the meal, explaining that it still wouldn't eat the whole carcass alone. After all, it was only thanks to Bomb that the poison had been gotten rid of. D.I. thanked the gargoyle for the offer and said that she would be happy to share the meal with him. So Albert sat down and was about to take a good bite of the dragon. When Dai stopped him again, warning him not to eat it raw, but to roast it, Albert admitted that he had some difficulty with fire magic, but the goblin declared that it was not a problem. She held out her backpack to her rescuer. She pulled out a magical stone and offered to use it, explaining that she had found the item on the road and thought it might come in handy. Albert marveled again at how good-natured the girl was, though the thought that the little girl had a good chance of survival and he, a gargoyle, could easily die made him a little sad. D.I. made a fire, which surprised the gargoyle. She had gotten firewood, so Albert said he would roast the meat as he didn't want to put everything on her alone. The goblin explained that there was nothing wrong with that. The main thing was that there would be food, as she suddenly stopped wondering with horror if the gargoyle was all right. He looked at her perplexed, shoving his hands in which the meat lay into the fire. Upon reflection, Albert realized the reason for the girl's surprise and therefore suggested that it was better not to do that. Otherwise, it would burn. The gargoyle through gritted teeth asked Day to help, and the latter, chuckling, promised that she would certainly help with everything. Albert leaned against Baum in an attempt to cool off, feeling a pleasant sensation, and soon Dai called them to lunch. The gargoyle looked at the roasted pieces of meat with gusto and couldn't wait any longer for permission to begin, despite the girl complaining about the lack of salt. Finally, Albert pounced on the skewers, greedily devouring one piece after another. Meat juice flowed inside him, which was not surprising, given that he had given himself over to the food, filling her belly. After a long 1,500 years, his first real meal was fire-roasted meat without a single seasoning, but it was still the best thing in the gargoyle's life. Albert even let a tear fall, causing the goblin to suggest that he didn't like the dish she had prepared at all. He admitted that it was delicious. Such simple words, but Albert simply could not find other words to express his joy. By the way, he even conjured some water to wash down the food. After filling his belly, Albert collapsed to the ground, admitting that he wondered where his new friends were going next. After hesitating, Day named a house in the western woods, 
where land had set a fire three months ago. Albert hadn't realized that entire settlements had been affected then. Now he was filled with a nasty feeling, for he himself had taken part in that raid. The women and small children had escaped, but many of the men had been killed. Di confessed that she was eager to help rebuild her home village. Considering that Lan had died, she suggested that perhaps she wasn't the only one who had managed to free herself and return there. Albert wondered if Bomb would go with her, and the girl confirmed the hunch by thanking the slime after it squeaked something. Still, Albert couldn't understand how the two understood each other. He himself had indicated his intentions to reach far and then go somewhere else. In that case, Di remembered that it would require crossing a mountain range, and so she noticed the lack of wings. Albert explained that they had been burned during the battle for the castle. However, he just didn't have the energy to tell the whole truth. Albert believed that if Beria was gone too, then everyone would finally be able to live freely. Speaking of wings, he again remembered his relatives, who had treated him so dirty, although, on the other hand, he could understand them. He wondered what they were doing in the city now. Suddenly, Albert caught himself thinking that his heart had somehow dramatically picked up. Even though he couldn't recognize himself, the gargoyle realized that he had held on for a whole 1,500 years. In fact, he regretted having to fight for all that time, and thus he promised that he would not show his anger anymore. However, he also promised that he would definitely take revenge the next time he met the Demon Lord, because he couldn't forgive such a thing. Suddenly, he turned his attention to the girl, whom he seemed to have frightened with his belligerent thoughts. Dei apologized for bringing it up, admitting that it was very rude of her, but Albert told her not to worry, because sooner or later, they would talk about it anyway. He shared his thoughts that the former captives were similar in some ways. Besides, he admitted that the meat came out just awesome. In any case, the gargoyle concluded that it would be a good idea to get some sleep now, and wondered if the new friends were sleepy. Di agreed, but asked the gargoyle not to worry, promising to keep watch. Albert objected that this would not do, and created a water barrier explaining that now they were protected and if anything happened, he would be the first to know about it. Very convenient, though magical barriers were not easy for a gargoyle. Di asked for permission to touch the unusual thing, and Albert did not object because, in fact, it is just water, but still warn to be careful because it is very easy to get out, but to get back in will be very problematic. The girl understood, but just couldn't miss the opportunity to play with the barrier. Watching this, Albert came to the conclusion that this girl was very funny. He assumed that she wasn't even 10 yet, but she had already lost friends and family to the war. The gargoyle decided to put those bad thoughts aside. Dai seemed like a nice girl in general, who had even saved Albert's life by preventing him from taking a bite of poisoned meat. He liked that she was so open and honest, for there were few such lively and bright personalities in this world. In any case, Albert said he was going to rest and turned back to the wall, hearing a final good night's greeting. Berea covered her face with a towel in despair, as a voice came from outside the door to warn the lady that the auditorium was full of those wishing to join the army. Berea apologized for the delay asking to be given a little more time. The mistress remembered with hatred about that gargoyle. The undead and various demons grow stronger every time they find themselves on the threshold of life and death. At the end of one such fierce battle, 12 of the strongest demons remained, and they were called lords. Exceptional power had four, which were nicknamed the Immortal Four. One of them is she, the demon lord Berea, who is a descendant of vampires. Three years ago, Berea asked her maid what idiot was planning to conquer her domain. When she heard Lan, she assumed it was that brash werewolf, though she remembered he was a Fenrir. Suddenly, he dropped his head to the table, unable to understand why this idiot had decided to do such a thing, since she was already drowning in work. The maid reminded her that Lan's had sworn allegiance to the Lord, so she suggested that they somehow unite and include him in their faction. Beria liked the idea, since in that case, they wouldn't even have to fight. In fact, the mistress admitted that making an alliance with King Lan would be just fine. The maid assumed that indeed everything could be solved by a peace agreement and handed Berea an envelope sent by Lance himself. However, having unfolded the letter, the girl found only threats written in large letters that the king was going to kill his colleague and take her place in the immortal four. The lordess sank back down on the table in despair, so the maid realized that the war seemed to be unavoidable. Beria did not understand at all what to do now, for it was in the spirit of a Fenrar to conquer impossible heights. Nevertheless, both she and Lan had their individual advantage suitable for battle. The Lordess was determined to make this underdog beg for mercy, 
and take his castle for herself. After a while, Berea's camp was already under the gates of the insatiable king's castle. She informed her subordinates that the attack should begin tomorrow, so they could relax for the day, though she warned the soldiers not to let their guard down. Suddenly, the soldiers drew the mistress' attention to a strange thing flying mindlessly overhead. Judging from its eyes, the girl concluded that this gargoyle was enchanted. This fact interested her greatly. Although she assumed that it was a common phenomenon for these places, one of the warriors threw a fire bullet at the gargoyle, blowing up the tower it flew past. Though Berea had no idea what their target was, they definitely got rid of it. The Overlady later found out that the surroundings of this castle are filled with creatures that are under a spell. Their actions are controlled, but here emotions and feelings remain beyond the control of magic. Lan uses them as puppets in battle. Beria isn't sure if this is a good thing, but Lan has no right to decide whether someone should die or live. Nevertheless, they had now blown that flying creature to smithereens, even though it probably wanted to live too. Suddenly, she saw their target emerge from the smoke, perfectly intact. Berea couldn't figure out what kind of gargoyle it was. Immune to the overlady sensed that the magic this monster was susceptible to was very different from what she herself possessed. It seemed to be her limit. Watching the gargoyle move, the girl came to a terrible conclusion. It is subject to a level 7 spell. This was very bad, because if Berea's army encountered the highest magic, everything would come to an end. She rushed forward, despite the objections of the warriors, and jumped on the walls, determined to stop that strange gargoyle, and then Lan himself. She assumed that once Lan died, the spell would fall as well, and all these unfortunate creatures would no longer serve her. Berea was about to use magic when she was spotted by a silent guard. The gargoyle grabbed the girl by the hair and pulled her down. He then slammed her against the surface, still also holding her by the hair, and finally drove the stake straight into her chest. Gargoyle decided it was done and turned his back to his defeated opponent, making a fatal mistake. Gathering her strength, Berea used the ferocity of fire to burn the monster's wings, permanently removing the latter's ability to move through the air. Now it was Lan's turn. This was how the Demon King died. In fact, he seemed to the girl a rather weak opponent compared to that gargoyle. A voice came from behind the door again, interrupting the mistress's memories of the past, though she had completely forgotten that she was expected. She asked to be given a little more time. In fact, just before she died, she had asked Lan about that gargoyle, though he didn't even seem to understand what it was about. Even though she had managed to keep her place in the Immortal Four, the girl's head had been filled with her powerful opponent the entire time. After the horrifying control, Lana Beriah decided to search for the mysterious gargoyle, who, from what she knows, has traveled to the southern part. She hoped he remained well. If he was capable of more, however, it would be a good idea to make him her subordinate. However, she assumed he hated life because of his burnt wings. Suddenly, there was a genuine shout from behind the door from the maid, who warned that there was no time anymore, as it had already been two hours. Noticing that the door was opening, the Lordess also shouted, ordering her not to enter, but it was too late. The maid found herself in the room, inquiring what she could do to help her lord, as she suddenly froze, staring in horror at Beriah's face, who immediately crouched down, feeling completely disgraced. Finally, Dei wished her friend a good morning, but he in turn assumed that the girl had not slept well, given the sleepy expression on her face, to explain that she was just thinking about the village, which would be very difficult to rebuild. The gargoyle apologized for his tactlessness, offering to go get wood to make breakfast, but Dei countered that it was fine. The important thing was that they were safe now. She began to build a fire, wondering if Albert was still gonna cross the mountains. He confirmed the hunch, explaining that there was no way to fly anyway. In that case, Dai cautioned that he should be careful not to run into various monsters, as she suddenly wondered why he couldn't use magic. Albert explained that he used it only in special cases, such as when he had to cross a dangerous distance of 100 meters, although he was very tired afterwards. He explained that his magic allows him to know if there are enemies in the nearest range, even though it is only 100 meters. But the information is very accurate, though at this point Albert is not quite free to dispose of himself, so he is often limited to only 10 meters. By the way, he uses this ability every time he sets off to be ready for an attack. Now he had mountains to traverse, and he admitted that he felt a certain fear that something untoward might happen. Finally, breakfast was ready, and the gargoyle again greedily pounced on the skewers, grabbing one in each hand. Di explained that she didn't think anything bad could happen in the mountains, because that's where the electric dragon lived. 
so it was bright around even at night. That's why, as long as they stay on course, everything will be fine. Albert admitted that he had not heard of such a thing, but he still wondered if the electric dragon was dangerous. Dai said that she had never heard of the creature harming travelers, so it probably wouldn't attack them if they didn't touch it. Then Albert asked why it was always bright, and Dai was surprised again, because it was obvious. But she decided to explain. Rumor has it that 2,000 years ago, the dragon let all its light out, though she doesn't know for sure if that's true. In any case, Albert stated that a lot of things had changed since then. Finally, Albert had had enough, and so decided to move out, as the goblin suddenly realized, and then handed her friend the wyvern skin sack she had been sewing all morning. Di explained that she was just thinking about how hard it would be for the gargoyle to carry the remaining meat in her hands. Of course, there wasn't much there at all, but Dai expressed her confidence that he would enjoy it. Albert was once again convinced of how wonderful she was after all, and so finally decided everything, announcing that he would go to the village with Dai. The girl reminded him that he was going to the city, but he remembered that very well himself. Albert explained that he had enough food now, so they could stay together a little longer. He asked if it was true that the settlement had been destroyed by werewolves. Albert knew they were monsters. He even assumed that they were still roaming around even after Lan's death, perhaps even hungry like he was. The gargoyle realized that this little girl probably wouldn't even notice if some undead decided to attack. Given the delay before answering, Albert had already decided that Dei would refuse, but the latter objected that she would be happy about this outcome, and Baum was also delighted. In that case, the gargoyle said that it would be a joy for him to continue traveling with his new friends. That's how Albert decided to go as far as Dei's village. On the way, Albert wondered if the couple had been eating only herbs all this time, and Dai confirmed his guess. She even named a few berries and seeds, which surprised him, though he didn't understand anything. The girl explained that it was not difficult to collect them, so she asked to tell him as soon as the friend wanted to treat himself to the gifts of nature. After a while, Albert felt as if he was about to turn into a fish and couldn't understand why the companions were so fast. Suddenly, Day announced that Baum offered to climb on him, and the tired gargoyle did not miss his chance, calling Baum a real man, although he was perplexed how this slime realized his tiredness. After some more time, the girl announced that they had made it to the site. Seeing a pile of ruins and a few surviving stone facades, up ahead. Albert wondered if this was the day house, which made the girl lower her head in despair. He concluded that there was no smell of decay, so the goblin assumed that her kin had returned and were just hiding. She approached the gate and shouted her name loudly, asking if anyone else was here. A few seconds later, the door of one of the buildings opened ajar, and a goblin as small as day eye stepped outside. The two little ones immediately hugged each other, tears streaming from their eyes. The girl confessed that she had never thought she would see Mai alive again, as she thought she had been taken by those horrible werewolves, but she explained that she had been able to return after Lan died. Another goblin came out of the same house, but taller, Yui, immediately recognized her big sister Sally, unable to contain her joy at seeing the girl safe and sound. Sally was overjoyed too, but turned her attention to the gargoyle, wondering who it was. Her DA introduced her companion, and the slime, explaining that she had met everyone on the journey. Mead wondered why she would come here with a gargoyle, but Albert himself intervened in the dialogue, explaining that there were many creatures in the forest, the appearance of which one might not even notice. As she thought about it, Day remembered that after the wyvern, they hadn't really met anyone. Albert assumed that it was because of Queen Berea's army, since the undead would scatter as soon as someone stronger appeared. It seemed that a soldier would be more likely than a monster. Only now did the girl realize why Albert had asked to go with her, and he confirmed that he had done so to ensure safe passage. As such, Mill thanked their sister savior, and they shook hands in a gesture of friendship. Soon the whole company was sitting around the table discussing everything that had happened recently. Dai asked her sister to tell what had happened after she left the village. Mead thought about it and remembered that when Lana's werewolves had attacked the village, the goblins had fought hard. After that, the women and children had to flee. Those who managed to escape were later able to find shelter five kilometers west of here. She said it would be possible to visit them. If Dai was willing, she was pleased that the villagers had survived, and then tearfully said she was sorry she had not been able to help in the battle. Mead also told them that the rest of the goblins had gone north. She suggested trying to contact the other survivors, since Dai had managed to get out of the forest. But Albert did not appreciate the idea, 
as he doubted that it would be possible to contact those who were at least five kilometers away. Actually asked not to worry about it, as it was only necessary to know the exact location of the goblins to succeed. Besides, thought communication was the only way they had managed to escape the werewolves. Day I wondered what the sisters were going to do now. Sally explained with a wistful look that since Lan was dead, they could go back to the village. But there was a problem. The werewolves who had attacked the village had split up among themselves. So there was a chance they might return. Of course, no one is here now, but there is no guarantee that everyone will be able to escape next time. Albert stated that he could handle it, so he asked his new friends to count on him. The gargoyle reiterated that he meant what he said. However, there was one more problem to solve. Everyone went outside and he created a huge water barrier, covering the entire village. However, Sally asked him to stop. She warned that the entire settlement could be flooded by the werewolves, which could not be allowed to happen. Di asked her sister not to worry, explaining that the barrier had protected them from the wyverns yesterday. But Sally said the water barrier wasn't all-powerful. It might be able to withstand the onslaught of some elves or wyverns. However, if the defense was breached, all that water would fall on the goblins. Finally, Albert asked for the objections to stop, as this barrier is made of all his love, so it simply cannot be defeated. She declared that she would easily break through the wall, and then pulled out her spear and raced forward, using various techniques whose names made the gargoyle tense up. However, all attempts were in vain. Day I couldn't believe that even her little sister couldn't break the barrier. As she struggled to get to her feet, she recognized that the wall was strong, but she noticed that the water barrier had one flaw. You could leave it, but you couldn't enter it. Albert explained that this was the reason why he was so sure that the werewolves couldn't get in. Sally concluded that no other creature could get in either, so she assumed that magical creatures, such as Albert himself, would be able to get in and out. But he argued that he could easily get in and out because he had a magical crest. Noticing that the goblins didn't quite know what he was talking about, Albert had to explain that his body also succumbs to magic every time he uses magic. Thus it too changes, taking the form of whatever he uses, be it water or fire. It is for this reason that he can pull off such things, and he is best at wielding water. Everyone who has magic has this crest, and depending on the creature, it can have a different shape. No two mages can have the same crest. It also affects what kind of magic you can use. If someone does have the same crest, their magic will be useless against each other. Noticing the confused faces of his listeners, Albert assumed that they were unlikely to understand everything, so he apologized for not being able to say it briefly. He paraphrased, concluding that if he was a mage, he had a special crest which was what allowed him to leave and penetrate the barrier. In that case, Sally asked if such a crest could be made for them as well, which seemed like a very good question for Albert to ask. He explained that it was theoretically possible. But there was a problem. What would the three of them do when the other goblins who didn't have these coats of arms came? Suddenly, the boys heard a familiar squeak, noticing that Bayum had already returned from his walk. Albert wondered if he was still walking. Suddenly, the slime just jumped up and jumped through the barrier, which made Sally wonder how he managed to get through. The gargoyle explained that bomb, like this barrier, was made of water, and it already had a piece of the crest in it. Albert recalled how he had used his magic to heal it and fill it with water. He realized that Bomb could share himself with the goblins, so they could penetrate the barrier without his presence. Except that when Bomb shrank again, the problem of entry would arise again. Too bad slimes don't last long. In that case, Di took a small piece of her pet and decided to test Albert's words. She stepped out and then jumped back into the barrier with a sprint. It worked. Suddenly, she hugged Bomb asking if he could stand to use himself all the time. As many goblins and quite often would want to go outside the village. Slime squeaked something in response, and Day I realized that he would be able to reincarnate every time, so there would be no problem. Finally, Albert concluded that now it was only necessary to put Bayum in the village, so that he could go in and out freely. In that case, Sally offered to tell this happy news to the goblins who were hiding in the forest. The girl thanked Albert for everything he had done, informing him that thanks to him, everyone would be able to live happily here again. In the meantime, Berea and her assistant were already making their way through the forest, and they would be in the goblin village in a little while. After a few days, most of the escaped goblins returned back to the village. Albert was riding bomb, watching the villagers rebuild, when suddenly a girl came up from behind and called out to Day. From surprise, the little girl opened her eyes wide, dropped the box and pounced on her mother with joyful cries. In the depths of his heart, Albert was happy about the wonderful reunion. 
so much so that he even let a tear fall. He told his friend that he would leave the settlement for a while, and then shouted to Baum to go ahead, as he had to look for more food. Albert had already had time to taste and pick a few fruits, and the slime squeaked every time one or another of the supplies seemed fit to eat. Soon the sack was full, and although the gargoyle could say nothing about the taste of the fruit he had picked, he made the decision to return to the village. He confessed to his companion that he wanted to shelve the idea of the city, for now, staying with the goblins for a while. He was also determined to hook up with a couple of beauties, because with them, his life as a gargoyle would be better. Suddenly, Bob squeaked excitedly. Albert could make out only one thing from this set of sounds. Someone was trying to penetrate the barrier. He couldn't make out anything else, so he suggested that the slime get to the place in his favorite way. Albert climbed onto his friend's soft body, and the friend took off sharply, rolling swiftly forward. Upon reaching the place, the gargoyle found a pretty girl frantically kicking the barrier with her legs, ordering the goblins to let her inside. Truly tried to calm the uninvited guest, and Day held out a drink, explaining that it would be safe to enter as soon as Albert arrived. But Liz wasn't about to wait for some human. He was watching excitedly from behind a tree. Liz was an elf, and the girl who had come with her was a druid. They were close, but Albert didn't want to cross them. Elves and druids always look like splendor itself, and are of the same species. The former have beautiful golden hair, and the girls, as a rule, have enviable breast size. Except that their temper is just awful. Druids are more calm, but they are not inferior to elves in attractiveness, although they use it to deceive guys. Albert realized that he couldn't escape so easily, but he still didn't want to be seen by Liz. When Dei noticed that the gargoyle had returned, she announced it happily, so now he had no choice but to go out wondering why the girl had called him now. He calmly asked what all the commotion was about, and in response Liz shouted, asking what the gargoyle had forgotten in the goblin settlement. The elf continued her outrage, explaining that she had come to visit Sally, but some barrier was making her look like a complete idiot and preventing her from getting in. Nevertheless, the girl grinned at the defense, admitting that it was a pretty cool thing, so Albert was confused at all, wondering if she was being friendly or angry after all. Sally explained that the Elfess was pretty straightforward, but actually very kind. The gargoyle wondered if it was really about this unstable one yelling to be led inside immediately. Finally, Albert cast a spell on both guests, and soon everyone was seated at the table. Mia explained that the reason for their visit was a favor they wanted to ask of the goblins. The fact was that while walking through the forest, she had heard the voices of her kin, the druids, and so she wanted to know where they were, and if they were all right at all. After the war between the demon lords Lan and Berea, the creatures trapped in the castle were finally able to find their freedom and scatter into the surrounding forest. Now the former captives are trying to return to their former homes, but on the way to their goal, these unfortunates may well become someone's lunch. Mia admitted that they were actually able to find and even reach their tribe. Dai turned to Albert, who, after a short delay, said it was no problem. His barrier could protect anyone. The druid was pleased, even though she thought that no one could get through the barrier at all, since she and Liz had failed. She explained that even though the druids had magic, it was still quite difficult for them to fight and defend, which was why she and her friend had come to the goblins. Mia suggested that the two women join forces. Sally argued that goblins were not the best choice for such purposes. If that was all it took, the druids could take care of themselves. The species is very susceptible to magic, and can use it successfully in battle. Moreover, their abilities will only expand with time. Sally assumed that the girls wanted to use her kin as weapons, and Maya, albeit regretfully, confirmed that she explained that druids were indeed capable of magic. They could make weapons, for example, but physically they were powerless. Mia promised to make such weapons as the goblins wished, and also stated that her tribe would take over the safety of the living creatures if Sally agreed. The latter said that they should discuss it with the others first but suggested that the guests should spend the night in the village anyway. Suddenly, Liz suddenly realized and pulled out a few rolls of supplies from her bag, announcing that it was in honor of the reunion of the tribes. Albert even thought that this elven woman was really as kind as Sally had said. Speaking of which, she turned to the gargoyle, asking to come out for a word. He even found himself somewhat glad that Liz's choice had fallen on him. Soon, they were standing outside, and the girl indicated that she would like to reacquaint herself with him and then gave her. In response, Albert called himself the strongest warrior in the world, though he was immediately ashamed of it. Liz admitted that she'd never met a gargoyle before, 
so she asked him to tell her a little about himself. Albert said he was a gargoyle, the only one of his kind, but again, he thought he was talking nonsense. In that case, Liz brought up the barrier, saying that they couldn't just walk into it, not even with magic. Albert wondered who had told her that, but immediately changed the question, asking if she was definitely an elf and assuming that she was hiding her powers. Liz admitted that she was not an ordinary elf, but a high elf. She explained that she had to hide her magic because it could hurt someone. Albert confessed that this was the first time he had met someone of the higher kind too, and Liz confirmed that there were quite a few of them left. They are of the same species as ordinary elves, but they can use water, fire, earth, and wind magic. She gave her companion one valuable piece of advice. No matter how rare the creature in front of you is, you shouldn't even try to find out more about it. Nevertheless, Albert did ask how many were left. Liz said five, including herself. The first was the demon lord, the next three were minions, and finally her younger sister. What he heard made the gargoyle tense up a lot. Now this girl seemed very dangerous to him. She didn't seem to realize what she was saying at all. In fact, right now he would rather not know any of this. Albert began to contemplate whether to run away or give up, but found the strength to ask what a high elf was doing in a place like this. Liz explained that she was just traveling. She confessed that she couldn't stand boredom, so she decided to see the world, and during her travels she even managed to make friends such as Mia. Albert decided to ask how it had happened, and the elf explained that she had gotten lost, and the druids had rescued her. The gargoyle interjected, but Liz ordered him to shut up. After all, it was a long time ago when she wasn't an experienced traveler yet, and she knows her whole country backwards and forwards. She asked him not to take himself for a mad woman, and Albert promised that he would try, though it would be difficult. Suddenly, the elven woman noticed the lack of wings, suggesting that it was Berea's doing. She warned him that he could lie if he wanted to, as she didn't want to believe such things, but Albert said that now it was time to return the favor. He handed her a hair, explaining that it belonged to the vampire, and asked Liz to act as a go-between, giving the gift to Berea herself. The elven girl was horrified, generally perplexed as to why such a thing would be kept, but Albert stated that it was in case another war broke out. The girl stated that she was very surprised how such an OF could create such a beautiful barrier. Liz warned that she couldn't give him anything in return, as that hair was an incredibly valuable thing, but the gargoyle countered that he didn't care and simply asked to be there for him if he needed help. Liz agreed to accept the hair, promising that she would do her best. The last phrase made Albert hesitate, so the elf started to make excuses, saying that he had misunderstood, but it was too late. Nevertheless, the girl stated that she was completely calm as she had been on guard all this time. She recognized that this barrier was actually working quite well. However, Liz explained that normal creatures kept all sorts of jewelry in their bags, so she didn't understand at all. What kind of idiot would keep something like a vampire's hair? Albert was slightly offended, but Liz immediately informed him that despite all the weirdness, she didn't hate her new acquaintance. Although he was pleased, he still couldn't understand the strange elf. A worried Mia came running out of the bushes, informing them that the village was under attack by werewolves. One of the monsters kicked a small goblin strapped to a leash, ordering him to move faster. Another little boy interceded for the unfortunate one, and then the werewolf kicked him, saying that slaves should not resist. The other wolf who was watching laughingly asked his comrade not to at least nail the slave. Sally couldn't believe that these beasts had captured Asta and Lynn, wondering if the two were even alive. Day whispered to the gargoyle that Asta was Sally's own brother. Liz offered to go in pursuit, promising to help, but Albert asked the Elfes to stop. He wondered if she had decided to fight the werewolves with her bare hands, but she countered that they couldn't hurt her. In fact, the question was whether the gargoyle itself could handle them, though he immediately caught himself thinking that he just couldn't lose. Nevertheless, he wondered how they would bail out the little ones if there were only two of them, so he suggested just talking to the brigands. The elven woman objected that it was a bad idea because the werewolves were strong, so they were hungry for more. In that case, Albert agreed to help his friends, which made Liz very happy. He explained that it just wasn't fair to let the elfess go alone, and then quietly asked if werewolves were too weak an enemy for her, but the girl ordered him to dismiss those thoughts, seeing her partner's fighting spirit. The gargoyle also declared that he would simply destroy these beasts. One of the wolves complained about such a long journey as the leader suddenly ordered them to stop. Noticing strange figures in the bushes, he ordered them out and Albert obeyed, leading Liz, who was shackled. 
the werewolf ordered the gargoyle to answer what kind of babushka he was bringing with him. And, confused, Albert did inform that it was his servant. The wolf was in no hurry to take his word for it, so he came closer and pulled off the cloak with a sharp movement, revealing a beautiful girl, and an elven wanted that. The original plan was to offer them Liz under the guise of a slave. Once those assholes were interested and agreed, Albert would offer to trade her to the goblins, and that would be it. The only problem was that after that, the elven girl would be left alone with him. It took him a lot of effort before the girl agreed to be bait. The wolves had already started to inspect the slave girl's beautiful body, but Albert reminded them that it was his elf. In that case, the interlocutors said they were taking her with them, and objections were answered with threats of reprisal, which made the great planner tense up. He offered to trade for goblins, as slaves would be very useful if war broke out again. Noticing that the werewolves were whispering, Albert was sure that the fools would agree, but he asked Liz to play along with whatever was going to happen next. Suddenly, he grabbed the girl by the chains and showed the potential buyers her body in all its glory, explaining that he had only recently bought her in Farah, but the elf was good for nothing. Albert drew their attention to her pretty face, beautiful forms, and gorgeous buttocks, saying that he hadn't even touched the slave yet. He explained that such a beauty should be used for its intended purpose and promised the wolves an incredible experience if they agreed to the deal. The werewolves remarked that it would be easier for them to just get rid of the gargoyle, but Albert objected that it would be better if he got rid of himself. He pretended as if he didn't understand why the wolves would give up these useless goblins when there was a chance to get their hands on something truly beautiful. One could only hope that these idiots would believe, and soon they agreed to the exchange, ordering that the elf s be given away. Albert asked the little ones to get out of here soon, explaining that they had come to rescue them, and that girl would be back soon. The werewolves looked at the elf's body with interest, discussing what they would do next, but Liz ordered them not to even dare touch her. She broke the shackles, shouting that she would remind Albert of all of this, and then used an ice pike, piercing the first wolf. The girl declared that they had come here to save the poor goblins, and then unleashed a hail of stone bullets on the remaining bandits leaving both of them no chance to resist. The werewolves couldn't understand why some elf was so strong, but Liz argued that she was the highest. Albert praised his friend for her excellent work, but she said she wasn't finished and swung an ice blade, which the gargoyle dodged at the last moment, wondering what it was. Liz charged him with concern, furious that he dared to use her, a high elf, as a commodity. She screamed that she would never be a slave to such games, but Albert explained that it was necessary for the cause it seemed that to her, they were more than just words. In that case, the gargoyle promised that he would take responsibility for his words and marry Liz, though he immediately realized that it was unnecessary. Firstly, couldn't believe the return of her kin unharmed and began to thank her friends for their help. But Albert argued that he hadn't done much, and Liz said not to worry because she was willing to do anything for her comrades. Soon everyone was sitting at the dinner table, and the elf accused her mate of grabbing the meat she'd gotten without asking but he noted that he'd been hunting too. So it was shared. Mia concluded that the pair got along, and Albert confirmed that Liz was actually nice despite her behavior. However, noticing her displeasure, he suggested they talk business. In that case, the druid suggested that an alliance between the tribes should finally be made. Seeing that the girls had found common ground, Albert exhaled, but suddenly Liz turned to him, asking what his plans were now. The gargoyle explained that he was going to Faro, Hearing this made the elven woman think it was actually unusual to see her like, given that her family owned this city. Liz jumped up from her seat and excitedly announced that she was going with him. The proposal was quite unexpected, although she had made the decision for both of them. Albert was surprised that she wanted to go along with him, despite everything that had happened, but nevertheless stated that he would be very happy about it, thus the gargoyle had a new friend to travel with. However, there was still one more thing to do. It was necessary to inform the others. Albert approached Dei and told her that he was going to leave the village tomorrow. He apologized if he had inconvenienced her and had not helped her recovery, but the little girl said that was nonsense, as all the goblins were terribly grateful for his help. She wondered if the gargoyle was leaving because of that, but Albert admitted that he felt he was needed somewhere else, and here he had already done all he could. Suddenly, Dai reported that Baum had something to say as well. She translated that he was very grateful for the help, because without water magic, he would have simply died. This made Albert embarrassed, and the girl asked him to stop by for a visit, because all the goblins would be happy to see him. Finally, Liz said she was ready to go, and the travelers set off, saying goodbye to their friends once more. 
This brings the first part of this relaxing and interesting manga to an end. What do you think of this manga? Is it worth doing a sequel? I will be interested to know what you liked and what you didn't like about this manga. Write about it in the comments. This is the end of our story. Remember, this is just the beginning. There's a lot more to come. See you later and bye-bye.